can uh, turn your Bible to um, Acts, first of all. We're going to look at two passages of Scripture this morning. Acts chapter 8, and then also Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 6. And we'll, we'll go back and forth between the two for a little, for some, so uh, if you got a pen or a a ribbon there, you just mark your spot in uh, in one. Uh, we'll start in Acts, uh, and then, like I said, we'll go to um, uh, into Hebrews here in a little bit. So Acts chapter eight, and then uh, Hebrews chapter six. chapter 8 and let's see verse let's start in verse 10 <clears throat> of verse 9 it says but there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power of God and to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, they, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor law in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the fall of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which have ye have spoken come upon me. And there we'll, we'll leave off our reading here in, in Acts. Um, <clears throat> we'll go to Hebrews in just a little bit. But here we find an account of this man, Simon. Uh, some have called him Simon the Magician. Uh, and he certainly was, all right? Uh, Simon the Sorcerer. Um, his surname is really not given, but he's recognized as Simon the, the ma Magician. And uh, an interesting case because... He makes a profession of faith. It says here that he believed. He was baptized. And yet, we find that everything was not right with Simon. And there was something wrong here. And uh, when Peter and John come then to Samaria and, and address the issue, uh, Peter treats him quite harshly. And, uh, and, and really deals with him you know, very, very hard. Uh, and all that was necessary. And we, we're going to look at... You know this man, and, and find out exactly what was going on here. Uh, the Holy Spirit's obviously left it for a reason, and I don't believe it's just to to give us the historical account. Um, I, I believe that you know we all things are given for admonition, and no doubt uh, I don't know this morning. Okay, I don't know the hearts of anybody of that for at any time for that matter, but I believe there are people like Simon who come into churches, uh, people like Simon who are religious. And yet they have never had a true conversion experience. And I hope and pray that that's not anybody's case here this morning. But if it were to be the case, I hope that today is the day that that has changed for you. Amen? Uh, because I wouldn't want anyone to uh, believe that just because they're in a good Baptist church, just because they go to church, just because they pay the, a, a tithe, just because uh, they're active in church, that they're saved. Because that's not the case. Simon made a profession of faith. Simon entered the waters of baptism. And he was as lost as he ever was. 
Being a Baptist, uh, being a church member, uh, doing good things is not what makes us saved. It's knowing Christ and having the Spirit of God. And Simon did not have those things. And we see that evidence here in the Scriptures. And so this morning, it's, it's more, quite a, a, a hard message. It's not one I delight in preaching, all right? Uh, but it's exactly where God has brought us. And as I've studied this, and like I say, in studying Hebrews as well, it's amazing how God has brought the two series together. This is the exact same topic, if you will, as to where we are in the uh, uh, expository preaching of Hebrews. And so that's why we're going to look at Hebrews as well this morning, all right? But uh, let's, let's ask the Lord to help us. And uh, give us discernment, give us understanding of His Word, and then uh, we'll get right into these Scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for this morning. Lord, I thank You for the Word of God. I thank You that it is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It is dividing the sunder of soul and spirit. It is a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Lord, uh, You know every person's heart here this morning. Lord, You know each one of Your children. Lord, You have sealed us with the Spirit of God. And Lord, You have given us the Spirit to teach us and to guide us into all truth. I pray that, Lord, the Spirit would do its work this morning. That, Lord, you would teach us and guide us. That, Lord, you would correct us. Lord, you would encourage us. Lord, more than anything, you would change us. I pray that, Lord, you would help me as I present your word. Lord, I don't have anything that, Lord, can help people this morning, but you certainly do. And I pray that you would uh, give help and guidance and more correction uh, where it's needed. Uh, Lord, uh, through me and through your word this morning as it goes forth, I pray that, Lord, if there's one here this morning, who is not sure of their salvation, that, Lord, today they would not leave this place without knowing for sure they're on their way to heaven when they die. Lord, I pray that you help each one of us who are saved, that, Lord, we would be resolved in our faith, Lord, to share our faith, Lord, to have a genuine salvation, and, Lord, demonstrate that faith to a lost world. We pray these things. We get glory and honor through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing we see here about Simon is... Uh, his, a little bit of his past, all right? He was deceptive in, his, in who he was, all right? Uh, go back up to verse 9. It says there was this man, Simon. He used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Uh, he had a power. Now, this, when it says he used sorcery and bewitched the people, it's not saying that he knew a little you know, magic tricks, all right? Um, last night we were watching, we like watching these old, the old TV shows. We were watching Dick Van Dyke, all right? Y'all remember Dick Van Dyke, all right? And um, it's a good, good family program most of the time, all right? And uh, he was showing little Richie some magic tricks he'd learned, you know? And uh, that, that was quite neat, you know? And um, even I you was know, just like, how do you do that? You know, just, you know, had the ball, you know, had so many balls and they disappear, you know? Well, they go up to sleep or something, you know? You know? And he was a good actor, you know? He was, he was a good guy. And th that's not what this is. Okay? This isn't just a little trick, you know, trick card or something. No. Um, when it says sorcery, it's speaking of supernatural powers. This was a, 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 a demon-possessed man. And he had the power to do some incredible things. And uh, when we see that he not only had power, but he was prideful. Uh, he giving out that himself was some great one. He wasn't claiming to know the Great One. He said, I am the Great One. <laughs> it's me. It's all about me. And even notice what the people said about him. He says, uh, verse 10, uh, they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying that this man is the great power. Not that he had the great power of God. Not that he knew the great God, but he is the power of God. Wow. What a statement about a man. You know, it's, it reminds me very much of how the Antichrist will come and deceive the world. Uh, from the smallest to the greatest, the least, all to the, you know, uh, all of them. You know, it, it's been said, some people can fool some people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. Simon did. And that's why, that's one reason I believe we know this was a supernatural power he had. He was a demon-possessed man. It wasn't just that he was a conniver and a trickster, you know, uh, as much as he was, all right? But he had a supernatural force, a dark side, if you'd say, if we, we might say, uh, that enabled him to trick all kinds of people. He, he, uh, he had tricked, you know, the, the well-to-do. He had tricked the poor people. He had tricked everybody. And they believed, hey, he, he's God. He's, he's got some power. He is in tune with the great one, you know. And uh, he had deceived many, many people. 
And he was very, very proud of it. Again, it was all about him. But there's a danger here. All right, let, let's keep reading. Uh, of course, we, we read about Philip, and we've, we've been preaching on Philip the past few weeks and how God used Philip. We looked at um, last week how God led Philip away from Samaria to the Ethiopian eunuch All right, at the end of chapter 8. And uh, God was using Philip and uh, preaching the gospel. Well, here he's preaching in, in Samaria, and many get saved. And it's the first time that the Samaritans are being reached. Uh, God has brought the persecution. God's scattering the church. He sends Philip to Samaria, and Philip preaches the gospel, and many of them begin to get saved. Well, this Simon joins the ranks. Verse 12 says, When Philip, uh, when they believed Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom, uh, let's see, they were baptized, men and women, then Simon himself also believed, verse 13, and he was baptized. So we see he makes a profession here. He does the same thing that everybody else does. And, you know, we, we might say, well, Philip didn't notice anything wrong. It's not Philip's job. You know? Now, this, this is a side note, all right? It's not up to you and me to decide who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. You know, when, when somebody comes forward and they say, or someone, you're talking to someone, maybe on the job, maybe in their home, and you're witnessing them, you share the gospel with them, and they say, uh, you, you explain it to them, and you say, would you like to be saved? Would you like to receive Christ? Would you like to pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins? And they say yes. And then they pray and ask God to save them. Guess what? In my book, they're saved. Amen. Amen. It's, I'm not their judge. God is their judge. You say, Pastor, what if they didn't say the right words? What words are you supposed to say? How, how many testimonies have I heard of people who didn't even say words? They said, God saved me. God helped me. I mean, uh, they, but they acknowledged their need. And God saw their heart and God saw their need. Amen. It's not up to us to judge whether they got saved or not. You say, well, Pastor, what about these people to get baptized and they're not in church anymore? What about them? I'm not their judge. I'm not their judge. Now, you say, does that mean we just baptize whoever walks in the church? You know, no, no. We do discipleship. You know, and we try to counsel them and help them make sure that make sure they have assurance of their salvation. Make sure that they're they're ready for that step. Understand what they're doing, and all those things. But hey, people, <laughs> Christians, get us up with the Lord all the time. <laughs> Sad to say, you know. And God has to chasten His children all the time. <laughs> Sad to say. And so it's not us to judge whether a person is really saved or lost based upon what they said or what they did. Uh, you know, just. Uh, in, a, in a, their early Christian walk. Right? God is their judge. And Philip here, Philip says, hey, he says he believed in Christ. He's accepting Christ. He wants to be baptized. I'm sure Philip, uh, knowing the, the, the history of Philip here, he, Philip knew the gospel. Philip was preaching the gospel. Philip wasn't uh, some loose preacher, we might say. Philip uh, would have sat him down and made sure he understood what, was, what he was doing and all those things. And when he was baptized, Philip probably was confident. He, Simon was aware that what he was doing and was genuinely saved. As much as any man can know in other man's heart. So there's no, uh, no need to you know, look down on Philip here. All right, And yet, there's a problem. All right, Now it doesn't show up until later. It doesn't show up until later. Let's just keep reading. Then, uh, let, let's skip down all right, and, and see what the problem is. All right? Uh, when Peter and John arrive, then uh, it says, verse 18, Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why would he offer them money to receive the Spirit of God? Number one, because he didn't have it. He didn't have it. When Peter and John came and laid hands on those believers in Samaria, which at that point in time, all right, and there's, there's a lot here, okay? We're not going to have time to cover everything. You say, why did they lay on the hands, Pastor? Why did the Spirit of God not come right away? Because this was a transition time. Okay? These are not Jews. These are Samaritans. This is the first time the Samaritans have been preached to with the gospel and received the gospel. This is a first time event. This is a transition period that God is moving away from Jerusalem, moving away from the Jews, and He's confirming that my gospel is not just for the Jews, it's for the whole world. And it's also for the Samaritans, the ones you despise. 
uh, you Jews despise. And I'm going to reach even the Samaritans. And so to verify that, God waited to send the Spirit of God until the Jews got there and could actually see it happen. And the laying on of hands is a tradition, and it's, it's a tradition, tradition passed on out into the church uh, through the Scriptures, all right? When uh, a man is called into the ministry and the church sets him apart, what do they do? First Timothy, laying on of the hands. Okay, laying on of the hands. That is something that God ordained in the Old Testament that now He's brought over to the New Testament church. And here, the laying on of the hands, that Peter and John, as the apostles, were signifying that we know you have been saved. You have, you have received the Christ. You are as much a part of the church as we are. And we are uh, confirming that with the laying on of the hands. We are validating that. That's a, and it, that's a whole message in itself. There's neither Jew nor Greek in the church. Amen. We are all one body in the body of Christ. That's what Peter and John were, were signifying here. All right, with the laying on of the hands. Them as Jewish men were signifying that we Samaritans, you Samaritans, have now received the same Spirit of God and been saved just like we are. And that, that's a glorious message in itself. But when that happened, Simon didn't get it. For some reason, Simon didn't get it. Because Simon wasn't genuinely saved. And Simon wanted it. So Simon believed that somehow he could get it on his own. And so now, verse 18, he offers them money. He says, verse 19, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. And it wasn't so much that he wanted the Holy Ghost as he wanted the power to give the Holy Ghost. That wasn't Peter and John's uh, power. That was God's power. There was no power in laying on of the hands. That was simply, a, 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 again, a confirmation that we recognize what God is doing. Amen. That God has done this. And we're just simply acknowledging that this is the work of God. That's all that was, was laying on of the hands. There was no power of Peter and John doing that. But Simon, he didn't see the spiritual. All he saw was the physical and the material. And he said, wow, I want that. I want to be able to do that. Yeah, it's interesting here. Um, Look at my notes. Make sure I, I see here um, exactly where it's at. Uh, look in, um, I'll look back in verse 13. Here, here it is. Where he says, uh, the middle part of the verse, He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. All right. The word wondered there is the same Greek word back up in verse uh, 9 where it says, He bewitched the people. And verse 10 as well, where, uh, verse 11, where he says he, be, he had bewitched them with sorceries. Simon saw the effects of the Spirit of God at work. And he and, and the, the be bewitched and be curious, it means he had a, 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 a curiosity. It means it, it, it puzzled him. He could not figure it out. Now, we as the children of God, when we see the Spirit of God working, we may understand all the... Uh, ins and outs of it, right? But we, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen, Romans chapter 8. And we recognize when the Spirit of God is working that that is the Spirit of God. Uh, Simon didn't have that because he didn't have the Spirit of God. And so when he saw that, it, 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 it drove his curiosity. And he wanted to be able to do that. Not that he wondered about it and was, oh wow, that, that's amazing and praise God this is working, but mm, I, want to, I want to have a piece of that action. He saw it as an opportunity to build himself up. And yet he was missing out on it. And he wanted to be able to get in on it. We see the danger that Simon was in. Let's turn to Hebrews now. Hold, you know, like I said, hold your place here because we're going to come back. But in Hebrews chapter 6, God warns the Jews of this type of situation. This type of believer. Alright? Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews 6, God has come up to, um, or God has used this writer uh, to give like a treatise, if you will, of why Christ is greater. And Christ is far better. He's compared to so many things. He's compared to the Aaronic priest. He's compared to Moses. He's compared to the angels and uh, over and over, Christ is better. He's a greater high priest. And he's our great high priest. Those things. Um, so chapter 6, he comes to and then he says, uh, verse 1, leaving, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So he's challenging these, these believing Jews. 
You need to leave the Old Testament ways. You need to leave the temple, leave the sacrifices, all those things. That was a picture of Christ. Now you have the Christ. Amen. We don't need the pictures when we have the person. Amen. Amen. We can go on under perfection. He's not saying leave the doctrines and, and forget those things. He's saying build upon those doctrines. That's your foundation. Now move forward on that. And so he's challenging to, to build on that. And that's tonight's message. All right? We'll co come back to that for 5 o'clock. All right? You'll get the rest of that. All right? Now, verse 4, though, he gives a warning. Verse 4, he says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh, and put Him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and, drinketh forth, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned." Here the writer says, you're to go on to perfection. You're to grow in Christ. You know who Christ is. You, you know the basics. Now you're, you're to be growing in Christ. And if you don't, if you don't, there's something seriously wrong. That's exactly what happened with Simon. Simon had a profession without possession. Simon did exactly what the writer in Hebrews here describes. Look in verse 4 and this, this description here. He says, It is impossible if you were uh, that have been made uh, partakers, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Here, partakers means that they were spectators. It doesn't mean that they had the Holy Ghost, they saw the effects. You know, here in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, it's, it's very possible that, the, that he's writing to people who actually saw the risen Christ. They saw what happened in Jerusalem at Pentecost. They saw the miracles. Some of them may have even sat under Christ's ministry. They may have saw Him on Calvary. He said, you were partakers of what the Holy Ghost did. You've seen what God has been doing since, since Calvary, the resurrection and Pentecost, all these things. You know what God is doing, that God has done with the Old Testament sacrifices. And that there is a New Testament now. And the Messiah has come and fulfilled all that. You know those things. You're partakers of that. <clears throat> he says, you were once enlightened. Enlightened here. He's saying, you perceived. Perceived. They understood it. They understood it. That doesn't mean they acted upon it. But they understood it. They understood that He is the Christ. They understood that we no longer need the Old Testament sacrifices. They understood that the, the miracles being done, that's the power of God. It's not some magic show. It's not some trick by these men, these fishermen. This is the power of God being demonstrated. This is real. They've been enlightened. He says... Verse 5, they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. You know, one person put it this way. It's, it's one thing to be in the kitchen when you, you're making a stew or something and you walk in and you, you smell the aroma, you smell all the vegetables in there, you add a little salt, and you, you got to, and you, know, you, you steam out all of those vegetables things and then you're making a soup maybe or something or... Um, Better illustration for me would be on a barbecue and steak, you know. You, you, you simmer the ribeye, you know, and, and uh, you know, you, uh, some of you, you got, the, you got the mushrooms and the onions on it, you know, and it's, I'm getting hungry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and man, that is going to be so good, and, and, and you, know, you even get the knife out and you slice, not, 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 not yet, not yet, it's still a little picky, you know, it's, you know, my mind got to be just right, you know, it's, no, not, not too much. You don't want it raw. You know, you don't want it raw, but you don't want it burnt. You know, you just, you know, and uh, and the juice is coming out of it. And, oh, man, this is gonna be so good. Again. Put a little sauce on. You know, just oh, so good. Man, it's, oh, you can almost taste it. But guess what? You've never tasted it. 
You've never tasted it. You know, it's one thing to come to church, sing the songs. It's one thing to give your money. It's one thing to amen the preacher. It's a whole other thing to know him. God says, oh, taste and see if the Lord is good. You've got to taste it. You've got to know him. You can't just come in and fill up here. You can't just come in and put your money in. You can't just come in and sing the songs. You've got to know Him. The writer here says, they, they could taste it in their mouth and yet they never chose to act upon it. They didn't take the final step of faith. <clears throat> they had tasted of the power of the world to come. They had seen the evidence of God. They would seen God at work. They'd seen what God could do to change lives. By this point, they've seen the Apostle uh, Paul and how God totally converted his life from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. They said, man, God is at work. God's doing things, incredible things. God's reaching Samaritans. God's given the, the gift of tongues to reach unknown nations among the Jews. Uh, God's doing incredible things. But they hadn't experienced themselves. That is the danger. That is the danger that God's writing these Hebrew believers. That is the danger that Simon in Acts 8 found himself in. He was right in the midst of it all. He was in the midst of the biggest revival Samaria had ever seen. And he was seeing, he was eyewitness to the whole thing, and yet it wasn't his own. He never acted upon it himself. He did outwardly, but he never owned it personally. That is the greatest danger. Church, that is the greatest danger, I believe, that many of our friends and family are in. I'm talking about my family. People that go to church. That's the danger of many of many people in Fong are in this morning. Fong is full of people who go to church. And because they go to church, they've been there their whole life, they think they're okay. They've got the right Bible. They sing the right songs. They go to the right church. They go to the church where our granddaddy was a preacher, where our grandmother always took us. They go to and do the right things. They don't curse. They don't you know, smoke. They don't chew. They don't run the girls that do. They do all the right things. It's not going to make a hell of a difference at the judgment seat. They'll be among those that they'll say, Did they not cast out devils in thy name and do many great works? And the Lord will say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. It's not what we do. It's who we know. Amen. Amen. There's a danger of simply being a partaker. There's a danger of simply perceiving and not receiving. The doom, then, we, we see the danger, all right, that Simon was in. We see the, the danger here that these believers were in, in or these people were in here in Hebrews. Now, last of all, we see the doom, all right? Let's stay here in Hebrews while we're here, all right? It says, verse 4, it is impossible for those impossible verse 6 says they shall if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance here the word fall away is the the Greek word that we get apostasy from okay and some people have taken this this is this is a, a critical passage in Hebrews all right um, and that's one reason I want to share it on Sunday morning this is one of those passages many people will take this and that, that believe you can lose your salvation and say see here it is here it is. You, you can taste the grace of God. You can be partaker of salvation. And then if you, if you don't keep yourself right, you're going to fall away. That's not what this is saying. That's not what this is saying. You say, how do we know that, preacher? Because God gives us everlasting life. Amen. He gives unto us eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Uh, there is no way that we can lose our salvation. These people were never saved. It is eternal life. They have seen the grace of God. They have experienced uh, the uh, fallout, if you will, the side effects of people getting saved. But they themselves have never personally been saved. And God says, when you come to that point, you sat in church Sunday after Sunday. You've heard the gospel over and over. You can quote the verses. You can sing the songs. You know the truth and you don't act on it. It's impossible. It's impossible. For you to be saved. That's a scary thought. 
That's a scary thought. Friend, we've got to know that we know that we know that we know. I've heard testimonies of people. My former pastor, his son, sitting in a revival. He said, I knew I had the whole church full. In his mind, he thought he didn't. I'm sure there's some who knew him good and knew better. But in his mind, he said, I had the whole church full. They thought, oh, he's the pastor's kid. He's doing right. He's, you know, nothing's wrong with Mark. He's okay. He's all good. He's fine. In a revival, God finally got a hold of his heart. 18 years old, I believe he was. And he said, it was like just as, as clear as a bell. He said, God spoke to me and he said, tonight's tonight. You get right with me tonight. You're going to get saved tonight. Or this is it. And he was grabbing the pew and he, he said, I could hardly wait till the altar call was given. He said, if I hadn't got saved that night, he said, that was it. God was done dealing with me. Because he kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And sadly, I've heard testimonies that have gone the other way too. Well, I just read this week, Brother uh, Dwight Moody, you know, years past, gave a story about a man who had come to one of his revival meetings and was under conviction. And Brother Moody went to... to Try to get you get get saved, and he says, "No, no, not 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 yet. You know, I'm just not ready to do that. I'm not ready to commit to the Lord and things. I, maybe maybe later." But man got sick and got deathly ill. He's in hospital. Brother Moody was back in town and heard about this man, so he went and visited him. And he says, "Oh well, if I get God, said, well, God give me the help, I'll come back to your meetings at this time. I'll I'll, I'll get right. I'll, I'll I'll get saved. Sure enough, God raised him up. He came to the meetings, didn't get saved." He says, oh, and I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's all right. I don't, need it. I don't need God now, you know. It's okay. It's all right. Well, a few years went by. And the man got sick again. And this time he is on his deathbed. Brother Woody heard about it. Went back to the town. Went to go visit him. And begged him to get saved. He says, you know the truth. You know what you're going to face. And the man just told him, says, Brother Woody, it's too late. It's too late. You know, I don't know that point when another person reaches that. I don't know that point. You don't know that point. We, we might say, well, Brother Moody was wrong in going after him. No, Brother Moody was right. right. We need to give every person every last opportunity they can. But I'll tell you what, there's a point that they reach that only they and God know when God says, it's too late. It's too late. And that is why, person, if you're here this morning and you don't know for sure you're saved and God is speaking to your heart, this could be the last call. And you need to make sure that you know because God has no obligation to convict you again. This could be the day. You have no promise of tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Today is the day we've got to know. The doom here that we see of Simon. Let's go back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. <clears throat> he says here, he saw them laying on the hands and he offered them money. Verse 19 saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. The problem was with Simon was not, <clears throat> not that he wanted the Holy Ghost. That was, that was a good thing. But he wanted it through the wrong means. See, when, when, when we get saved, we receive the Holy Ghost. It is a gift. Amen? It is the gift of God, not of works. That's any man should boast. Uh, we are uh, baptized into the Spirit of God, into the body of Christ. It, it all, it, it's a free gift. Salvation is a gift. Well, when you look at money... Money is something we earn. Money, we go to work. We, we work for it. Um, maybe if um, uh, we're on a pension, we've worked all our life for it, and now we're reaping the benefit. Amen? Literally. <laughs> we're reaping the benefit. And it's something we've earned, though. And we're living off investments we've made, and we've invested wisely, and we're, we're living off the rewards of that. All right? It's something we've earned. We've earned it. It's us. It's all about us. And Simon said, I don't want the gift. I want to buy it. Mine. My work. My effort. 
something that I've done. He wanted to do it himself. And that's where he messed up. He totally misunderstood the grace of God. But it was a gift. He thought he could earn it. <coughs> and if you're here this morning and you think that coming to church, that giving to the church, that doing good in the church, that living right, that just doing your best is going to earn you the Spirit of God and earn you the favor of God. I'm sorry, friend. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I think the majority of us understand that this morning. I hope every one of us does this morning. But that's the truth. Amen? That's the truth. The price. Simon tried to buy the grace of God. And that there is evidence he did not have the Spirit of God. If he'd had the Spirit of God, he wouldn't have been trying to get it. He would have already had it. He would have understood that. But he didn't. The penalty then, look at verse 20. Peter said to him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God would be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor, uh, nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God. You know, Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 45, Out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaketh. What was in Simon's heart eventually came out of his words. Back in Hebrews uh, 6, there I spoke about them falling away in apostasy. Many times we see, we see uh, leaders in, in the churches and leaders in denominations, and they, they make bold statements, and they make statements of, uh, you know, uh, against the scriptures that like for, they deny the virgin birth, they deny the blood of Christ, they deny all the resurrections, they deny the miracles. You think, but he's the leader of such and such church. I mean, they're a pastor. They're, why do they do that? They're turning away. And you say, were they really saved? Only they and God know. By the abundance of the heart, now speaketh. They're giving away that they never really knew the truth because they're denying, they're denying the truth. It's not that they lose it, they never had it. Because you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot lose eternal life. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's never taken away. But those who go uh, into apostasy, those who deny the doctrines of Christ, those who deny the free gift of salvation, they never were saved to begin with. Dude, that's exactly what Simon is doing. He has fallen away. Uh, let's keep reading then uh, verse 22. Peter says, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And it's not that if perhaps God may forgive him. God would forgive him. But it's, would you get right? Could you get right? Would you see where you are if perhaps... God will forgive you and you recognize where you are spiritually. You recognize the danger you're in that you are uh, blaspheming against the Holy Ghost trying to buy the grace of God. Peter tells him to repent. We see the penalty. And then last of all, we see the plea that Simon makes. Verse 24. Our Verse, uh, yeah, verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which I've spoken come upon me. I've heard this over and over from people I love, my family. Uh, the study is it breaks my heart. How many times have you had somebody come up to you and they say, you tell them what's wrong. You show them like, you show them from the Bible what they need to do to get right. Maybe they're even they're lost. They don't even claim to be saved. And you said, you just you need the Lord. You need to get things right with our God. You need to acknowledge your sin and trust Jesus as your Savior, and He can help you with this problem. He can He can forgive your sin. He can help you. And just like Agrippa, later on, it said, almost that persuades me. Almost persuaded. Yeah, that, that's <clears throat> Not, not today. Not today. And then they make this statement. Would you pray for me? Yeah. Yeah, would you pray for me? David, I really appreciate you talking to him today. Would you pray for me? Oh, Pastor, I really, I'm really glad you come by. Would you pray for me? I'll pray for you. My prayers are going to help you a bit. You need to pray. You need to repent. 
know, if, if we're trusting in what our parents do, what our pastor does, what brother or sister so-and-so does, and, well, we'll just wing it to heaven on their prayers. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. It's not good enough to know somebody who's getting in. It's not good enough just to know somebody who's saved. You've got to know the Savior. It's a personal choice. Simon did not recognize that. Simon, he said, would you pray for me? Yeah, you pray for me. Peter could pray all he want to, but until Simon chose to get right and make the personal choice himself and get things right with God, nothing was going to change. Nothing was going to change. Let's go back to um, Hebrews 6. And uh, we'll close out here. Hebrews chapter 6. Look at the last few verses here. Here the Lord gives an illustration of, of these who fall away from the truth. Here we, and, and again, he says it is impossible for those. Meaning that, you know, that there is a that there is a there's beauty and innocence, we'd say. Alright? Uh, those who do not know about Christ and do not know their need of salvation, they still need to be saved. They still need to hear the truth. But they will not be held accountable to such a degree as those who do know the truth. And those who, uh, you know, we would say those who have been in church all their life, those who have sat under sound preaching, those who have heard the gospel, you know, as we hear messages, and even after we're saved, as we hear the truth and it's, it's taught and it's preached to us, we're accountable for that truth. You know, God holds me accountable to more truth than some of you. Because I've had opportunity to sit under more preaching than some of you. Now, that's not boasting on my part. That's uh, to, to my shame. Because God holds me accountable to do more. <laughs> I have a greater obligation. I have a greater responsibility. Uh, God's allowed me to go to Bible school and, and learn some things about the Bible. God holds me accountable to that knowledge. To teach you and teach others. And, and uh, obey that knowledge. Amen? And the same thing is true in, in salvation. Those who have heard the gospel and understand the gospel then have a responsibility to respond to the gospel. And once you understand it, you can never go back to that point to where you say, I don't get it. I just don't understand it. I don't understand anything about you know Calvary and Jesus and, and the Russian myth. You can't go back to the point where you were ignorant. You can't. It's impossible to go back to the point of ignorance once you come to the aid, that point of enlightenment that you understand it. And that's why it's so dangerous. Because once you understand it, you then have an obligation to act upon it. And here these People are refusing to do that, to, to, to take action. So verse 7, he says, or I'm sorry, verse 6, he says, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. You know, the, the mob at Calvary, and they cried, crucify Him, crucify Him. We have no king but Caesar and all those things. They did it ignorantly. They had been... Uh, Worked and coerced by the Pharisees and the religious uh, groups to have the Son of God crucified. And even in that moment, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They were ignorant of who He was. The, 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 the mob that day, they did not realize that they were crucifying the very Son of God, the one who came to redeem them and save them. He said, they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. And His love for the very ones who nailed Him to the cross, He forgave them because they knew not what they did. And yet, there'll be people who will sit in our churches. There'll be people who read their Bibles. They know the truth. They know He's the Savior. They know their need of a Savior. They know their sin. On and on. They understand all the truths. They've, under, they've memorized Bible verses. They've been in church and Sunday school all their life. And then they'll say, not doing it. For whatever reason, pride, stubbornness, self whatever. Maybe it's a sin they're harboring in their heart and they won't, they're not going to let go of it because if the day God saved, they knew they couldn't live like this. And so they continue to live a double life. 
continue to try to deceive people. Continuing to do their best. Whatever it might be. All right? The excuses they make. And they do it, not ignorantly. They do it willfully. And God says, you crucify the Son of God afresh. Because you know He's the Savior and you choose to reject Him. You choose to reject Him. He says, there's no way. There's no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. Verse 7, he says, he gives this illustration. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. He's saying the, the earth that is, is worked and, and the seed is planted and it's, that there's rains, it brings forth a fruit. It brings forth fruit and it is blessed by God. Verse 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. If you were to plant good seed in your garden this year and all that comes up is weeds and thistles and briars, you don't get any tomatoes, you don't get any cucumbers, you don't get anything. What are you going to do with that? Discard it all. Just till it up. Might even move to a different plot because that ground, something's not right with it. I planted good seed there. I fertilized that. I watered that. I made sure all the animals all, you know, stayed out of that. Something's wrong with that ground. Something's not right. I planted a good seed there and it didn't come up. There's something wrong. I'm going to discard it. God said, that's the condition and that's the conclusion of the soul that takes the good seed of the gospel and does not let it grow. He said, if you can take the seed of the Word of God and let it be implanted into your mind, and never let it germinate in your heart. He said, I've got no use. It's just discarded. It's fit to be burned. How tragic. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be like that. If you're here today, I don't know anybody's heart, okay? But this is where God led us in His Word. If you've never led the knowledge of Christ come into your heart and claim it as your own, you can today. Amen? Don't be like these in Hebrews 6 that turned it away one time too many who refused to accept Christ. Don't be like Simon the magician that thought, I can earn my salvation. I can make it work on my own. I can buy my way to heaven. I can wing it on somebody else's prayers. Because you won't. You won't. As many as received Him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God. You have to make the choice. It's a personal decision. It's a personal salvation. Amen. God <clears throat> expects those who live under the influence and the sound of the gospel to receive its message. Have you received the message? Are you sure of your salvation? And like I said, I would I never want to preach a message. To make someone who, who is saved doubt their salvation. You know, I believe that <clears throat> doubt is one of the number one tools Satan has. It was his first tool. In the garden, he said, Yea, hath God said. I believe when a person doubts their salvation, and I'm speaking from experience, okay? I've dealt with doubt and salvation. I believe almost every believer does at some point in their Christian walk. Every time the devil comes and says, Yeah, but. What if he cast doubt? Almost, almost unanimously, every testimony I've heard of people who were in church and then got saved after they'd been in church, and people were surprised they got saved. They thought they were saved, and then you know later on they found, they realized they were not. The pe pe people in the church realized that. Almost every testimony I know, everybody that I've talked to like that, they come back and they said, "I knew I was lost. I knew it." They're just like this man I spoke about a while ago. I knew I was lost. I was playing church. I knew it for years. I was playing Russian roulette with my soul. Just hoping God wouldn't let me go. And finally God got a hold of him and said, this is it. Hey, if you're like that this morning and you know you need to get right, today's the day. Amen. Don't, don't gamble with your soul. You don't know when God's going to say, that's enough.
I'm tired of playing games. Make sure that you know that you know. Make sure you have a Bible reason why you know you're going to heaven. Amen? Let's close in word of prayer.